crimes and expectations of punishment. Next, about books. First, Senator John Ashcroft of Missouri discusses the themes in his book, Lessons from a Father to His Son. Then, investigative journalist John Kelly and the book he's co-written called Tainting Evidence, Inside the Scandals at the FBI Crime Lab. Now, Senator John Ashcroft discusses his book, Lessons from a Father to His Son. The book sets forth lessons the senator learned from his father, a pastor and college president. John Ashcroft is a Republican elected to the U.S. Senate from Missouri in 1994. Before that, he was governor of Missouri. He talked about the book at this year's Christian Booksellers Association convention in Dallas. Oh, thank you. You tell me when to go. I'm on. Okay. It's my, it's my pleasure to introduce Senator John Ashcroft from Missouri. He's the two-term governor there and he's won in landslide elections both times. He, he's now serving his first term in Senate. He's a past national chairman of the National Governors Association. He's also a past national chairman of the National Association of Attorney Generals. His motto is to bring America's values to Washington. And he's also the, the author of Lessons from a Father to a Son from Thomas Nelson Publishers. And we're proud to have him here with us today at the CBA convention. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you and to see so many friends here. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk just a little bit about lessons from a father to his son. It's a book about my father, my father who invested himself inordinately in his three sons. But it's written from the perspective of just one of those sons, from my perspective. I believe that there is no more important responsibility in a culture than the transmission of values from one generation to the next. If we do our job in transmitting the values of America to the next generation, we'll have a future for America that's as bright as America's past has been. If, however, we don't transmit the right values, we will not long enjoy the kind of prosperity, both morally and economically that we've enjoyed in the past. I had the privilege of saying on the Senate floor the other day, and you'll notice that senators are the kind of people that have egos that allow them to quote themselves instead of other great people. And I had the privilege of saying on the Senate floor the other day that if moms and dads in America can do their job well, governing America will be easy. However, if moms and dads in America can't do their job, governing America will be impossible. So when I wanted to say something that I thought would be inspirational, I wanted to talk about my father, who did a job as well as I could possibly imagine it being done. Now, this is not a male version of Mommy Dearest, which was a way to provide uh, for an excuse for one's bad behavior and make it the fault of one's parent. I don't believe America is great because we find excuses for bad behavior. As a matter of fact, America is great because people take responsibility for their own behavior. People who take responsibility, they, they don't find fault, they fix the problem. The people who look for excuses, they fix the blame instead of fixing the problem. The history of America is fixing the problem, not fixing the blame. And there wasn't a problem or any blame really with my father. Lessons from a father to his son is a set of stories about how my father sought to transmit the right values to me. They were profound values, and they were very important to me. Let me just say at the outset of my opportunity to speak that this book is designed to be an inspiration. It's designed to help you think of good things your parents did for you, things they did with you, lessons they taught you. It's not designed to be a prescription. It's not designed to be an automatic statement that these are the lessons you have to teach, but it is designed to be an inspiration these are lessons which were taught, and some of them are lessons which you might consider to be important. They are lessons which you will find that your parents taught you, but perhaps used different ways of teaching you. Not many of you were eight years old when your father took you up in an airplane, for example, an old Piper Cub that was put together sort of like a Tinker Toy toy with canvas sides, not metal, and sat you there in the front seat of the plane after 
starting what was a rickety old machine and then climbing into the back seat and flying off with you and then telling you that you had the opportunity to fly the plane and instructing you to grab the stick which was between your legs and to push it forward and watching you learn that what you do has consequence in life and reminding you that you had to be careful what you did in life. It could make fundamental changes in how you were, you, you, you would live or die, survive, succeed or fail. Let me just talk to you a little bit about my father because I want you to know some of the lessons he taught me. And uh, you should know, and I think we all know, that for parents there are no timeouts. The eyes of our children are on us every minute, from the time they are born until the time we die. And so the earliest lessons of my life included that plane ride when I was eight years old. But the most profound lessons that my father sought to teach me were when he was 80-some years old and I was taking an oath to become a United States Senator. During my time as a United States Senator, I've thought very frequently about the lessons that came to me from my father. Each morning, my father would start the day with, a, with two things, two activities, which are indelibly imprinted on my mind. He always opened the day in prayer, and he made sure that he was praying in such a way that the family participated, whether they came in to pray with him or not. And uh, that is a good way to say that each day we should invite the presence of God in our lives. We should summon ourselves to our highest and best. He prayed that we would learn to do noble things that were of service to those around us. It was a model of seeking to do that which was at our highest and best, that which was noble. My father was committed to teaching his sons that we were created for the opportunity of service, and that was important. The second thing that I remember my father doing every day of his life was shining his shoes. He wouldn't leave the house without making sure he was at his best in order to extend himself in service to others. This approach has stayed with me for a long time. Now, don't look at my shoes to make sure that they're glistening today. But I want every day to do what I can to be ready for the world and to be ready to respond to God's call in my life. These parallel tracks, my father used to always say, never dress for the job you have, John. Dress for the job you want. It was his way of saying, make sure that when that job becomes open, people who are going to fill that job can see you fit into that job. So if you don't dress for the job you have, you dress for the job you want. You'll be ready for the job when it comes. When you prepare yourself physically for the jobs that are available, that's one lesson. To prepare yourself mentally and emotionally and spiritually for the opportunity of service is another lesson. Both of these were lessons that my dad taught to me. He taught them to me on a daily basis just in the way he lived. But perhaps the most dramatic of all the lessons my father taught me were the lessons he sought to teach me as I was entering the United States Senate. And as a matter of fact, that's the reason I began to write this book not too long ago. My father was in ill health. He had suffered a heart attack following the sudden death of my younger brother, Wes, in a car wreck. And uh, during the last uh, three years of his life, his heart was only providing about one-third of the service that a normal heart in an individual of his capacity would provide. That meant that he was very limited in what he could do. But he determined that he was going to come to Washington, D.C to provide me with lessons about how I should conduct myself as a United States Senator when I would take the oath of office on that uh, morning in January. My father had come and had decided that he would get as many of the members of the family together as he could for an evening of, uh, of a dinner and celebration on the night before. And he had arranged with friends to have a room at what, what is called the Capitol Hill Club there in Washington, D.C. We had dinner, and he had made sure that there would be a piano in the room because my father always liked to sing a few songs and have a little music with the family. He understood that there are real lessons in music, that music is a way of demonstrating for us that we don't all have to be the same to be valuable. We can sing different parts. We can sing different tones. 
but if we're pursuing a common objective, we don't have to be uniform to be in unity. And when we have that diversity, pursuing an, an objective which is common, it can actually be better than if we were all uniform. So at the conclusion of the meal, my dad said to me, John, why don't we sing a song or two? He knew that I would say, because this happened this way almost every time, Dad, if you'll sing, I'll play. He said, okay, I'll sing. So I went to the piano. My father went to the piano and I said, Dad, what would you like to sing? He looked at me and said, how about that song, We Are Standing on Holy Ground? I was kind of interested. My father had loved that song. It was a song that he had asked to be sung at my mother's funeral when she had died almost 10 years earlier. So it was not a surprise to me. But it wasn't until my dad finished the song that I began to understand what he was trying to teach in that moment. This was another lesson from my dad. He wanted to say that just as Moses could understand that where he stood on the desert on the backside of Egypt could be holy ground if you invited the presence of God there, he wanted us also to understand that Washington, D.C., which might not appear to many people to be holy ground, if we would invite the presence of God, if we would invite our highest and best, if we would uh, shine our shoes and then pray to God that he would endow us with a capacity to pursue noble objectives, Washington, D.C. could be holy ground. Now, I don't say this in the sense of making Washington, D.C. a religious shrine. It's not and shouldn't be. But I think freedom is the work of God. It's the way God wants men to exist. And the pursuit and protection of freedom is that. Of course, we all know that it's against our religion to impose our religion. God made us free, and government shouldn't impose religion on anyone. But it is important for our governing structure to respect the opportunity of people to be free and to respect families in which freedom can be taught in the context of a God who is the source of freedom and who grants freedom. Governments may guarantee freedom, but only God grants freedom. That's why our founding documents say it very clearly. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and that among these is life and liberty, freedom endowed by the creator, the gift of God. He came to tell me and to make sure I understood another lesson in life that no matter where we are and what we're doing, we can be standing on holy ground. The next morning was the morning at which I was to take to, uh, in which I was to take the oath of office. It was kind of interesting. I had hoped that we would have a special opportunity like those mornings when I was a boy to invite the presence of God in what we would do. So we gathered together in a room and we were having a time of discussion, at which time it became clear to us that my father wanted to teach another lesson. And uh, the room was rather still when my dad began to speak in earnest. He put it this way, my father, having been a minister, was very direct with what he said. He said, John, he said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of humility. He said, the spirit of Washington is the spirit of arrogance. He said, always seek to act with humility. Nothing of lasting value in the world has ever been accomplished in arrogance. I have heard that voice many, many times in the last several years. Many times I've failed to act with humility and the voice comes not to haunt me but to remind me of a solemn responsibility of public officials to act with humility knowing that the citizen is the highest ranking individual in the United States of America and those of us that are elected are elected to serve not to be served always serve with humility he said never with arrogance and then it came time for the prayer and uh, sensitive to my father's feeble condition I knelt in front of the sofa in which my father was seated and several of the other family members and friends who had gotten together with us that morning gathered round to join in prayer. Those individuals came and put a hand on my shoulder or maybe even placed a hand on my head as a way of saying we're praying for you as it came to be the time when we would pray. And I noticed my father at that time began struggling, swinging his arms. He was seated in one of these sofas that tends to uh, capture you, shall we say? And as he was swinging his arms rather violently to get out of the sofa, I said to my father, Dad, 
don't struggle to stand and pray over me as these others are standing to pray. He said, son, John, he said, I'm not struggling to stand. He said, I'm struggling to kneel. And my father rolled out of that sofa onto the floor and erected himself from his hands and knees to a kneeling position to pray that we would invite the highest and best, the noble ideal of service, into my opportunity to serve in the United States Senate. Now, there are people who will tell you that the way to deal with your kids is eyeball to eyeball. Some will say that we've got to deal with our kids nose to nose. But on, the, on that day, the day I was to be sworn into the United States Senate, my father decided to deal with me knee to knee. When I think of America and the potential of lessons that we would pass from the parent generation to the child generation, lessons from a father to a son, lessons from a mom to a daughter, lessons from a mom to a boy, or from a mom to a daughter, or a father to a daughter. These are the kinds of lessons that I thought recommended themselves for inclusion in a book about my dad. My dad wanted to, me to understand at every level that there was an opportunity to pursue our highest and best in the context and noble framework of service that he said was modeled by the spirit of humility, not by the spirit of arrogance. I'm grateful to Thomas Nelson for allowing me to write this story about my dad. I want to share my dad with as many people as I can, and I continue to want to learn from my dad as I continue to live and make an effort to transmit values to the next generation and to the new grandson, James Robert, named for my dad, James Robert Ashcroft. I believe that our opportunity to do that is a, one of the profound privileges of life. So I thank Thomas Nelson for making this book possible. I thank my dad, and I thank all the parents who understand that the transmission of values from one generation to the next is the single most important responsibility of a culture. Thank you all, and God bless you. bookstore in the world. Oh, great deal. Uh, we just really want to get you in. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Thank you. Hi, Thank you. From Missouri. Oh, great. Uh, huh? The camera's not working. <laughs> it takes them a while to develop. Oh, yeah. They're, they're fine. Hi. Hi, Howard. Howard. St. Louis, Missouri. What a good deal. Oh, that's my client, sir. Glad to see you. Glad to be here. Excellent. Hope to be active Thank in you. your campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, How are you doing? Let's just do it like this. Okay, a little bit closer. Are you ready? Excellent. Thank you. How are you doing? It's so nice to meet you. Thank nice you. to see you. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, how are you we doing? We met in Hibbing, Minnesota yeah. with Rod Grahams. <laughs> that was a great day. Yes, I enjoyed was. that. I didn't I know, know about Hibbing. I'm, I'm welcome. I'll never I'm, forget it. I'm going to welcome you back to Minnesota. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Already? Wow. <laughs> she wants another film, huh? <laughs> this could take a while. Oh, she's got cameras ready for loading. <laughs> hey, 
Springfield just the other day. She's from Osceola. Are you from Osceola? Yeah. 
looks to me like it takes a real grip to do that.